Hello there, if you're joining, this is Kelly Smith uh, from Prenda, and we're going to get started in the next two minutes. Hopefully you can see the chat option on the right side of your screen. Uh, we'll be using that as we talk today. So feel free to drop a note, say who you are, uh, specifically if you have any questions you'd like to talk about. Today during our uh, webinar, if you put those in there, I will do my best to address them as we go. Okay, I'm showing 11 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, we'll give it just another few seconds and we'll get started here. Thank you to those of you who have joined. Uh, I can see people are still coming in. So we're gonna wait a little bit. If you're having any issues uh, with the technology, um, you can chat that in as well. On the right side of the screen, you should have a chat option. And uh, you know we'll, we'll be using that throughout. So um, go ahead and type something in there and, and that'll allow us to uh, communicate and make this interactive as we go. Hopefully uh, this tool's working. I haven't used it before personally, but uh, I've heard good things and all my tests seem to work. So if you have any issues at all, please let me know. Okay, well, it's time. It's, it's 11 o'clock, um, and I'm just excited to be able to do this uh, webinar with you. Thanks so much to those of you who have uh, joined and, and logged on. I, uh, I hope everything's working. I, I feel like I want a stronger feedback loop to be able to see, but there is a chat on the side, and you should have also received an email from me um, last night with the instructions. So uh, feel free to use either of those if you're having any issues. Of course, if you are having issues, you might not see me right now. Um, my name is Kelly Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Prenda. And it's, it's a new company. We just started at the end of last year. The whole goal of Prenda is to help libraries provide computer programming uh, for kids initially, but we're also doing experiments with uh, adults and teens and senior citizens. My goal is that every library becomes a place where people can show up and teach themselves computer programming with your help, uh, facilitated at the library. So we'll talk a little bit about how I think that's gonna work and, and why I'm so excited about it. But uh, just as an introduction, that's me and, and that's what I'm doing. Just uh, for background, I don't have a, uh, a library background. I'm coming from the technology world I studied uh, physics in college and I ended up at MIT studying nuclear physics. 
And while I was there, I was using computer programming all the time to analyze data and do different things. Um, after that, I realized that it's applicable not just for analyzing experimental physics data, but also um, for uh, you know improving business processes and helping people with whatever they're trying to accomplish. Uh, definitely marketable and useful skills to have. Uh, but for me, it was also about fun, and I've, I've been able to do some uh, just for no other reason than I just think it's interesting. Put up a website and and do things like that uh, with these technology skills. And so it was natural for me a few years ago uh, to want to try out computer programming. And, and my natural inclination, because I grew up going to the library, uh, was to let, let's go to the library and let's see if kids at the library will come and, and uh, work on coding with me. And so that's been a fun experiment. Um, and I've, I've loved learning about the libraries, rediscovering the libraries, seeing all the changes that are happening. Uh, it's, it's, as you know, a very exciting time for uh, for libraries. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and put up some slides, and I'll talk through that. Just for uh, logistical information as we get started, there is a chat window along the side of your screen that you should be able to type in any questions or any comments as we go. Uh, I'll be monitoring that throughout, and so I'll encourage you to do that. And then. Um, as we go, I'm going to be sharing some slides and, and discussing uh, just so you know kind of where I want to go with this hour. Um, I spend a little bit of time at the beginning, but not too much uh, trying to convince you why coding is important and, and why I think this matters. Uh, just a few slides. What I find in, in meetings like this, uh, and especially people like you who have signed up for this, is that this is something you're already thinking about. So. Uh, rather than preach to the choir, uh, I want to kind of go through that quickly and then get into the nuts and bolts of how to do this, what I've been doing. So I'll share a lot about kind of my personal story over the last two and a half years and then working with another, um, you know, we have 30 libraries directly that we're, we're providing software and resources for, but we've helped and, and I've talked to people at over 100 libraries trying to get coding, as I said, in every single library in the country. Um, so that's kind of the, the scope. And then at the end, we'll get into you know, some, some tips that I have for successful implementation and some resources that you can use uh, to get off the ground. So uh, hopefully that's going to work for everybody. And um, I'm going to go ahead now and click share my screen. And this should let me share PowerPoint. So hopefully that is showing up OK. Um, it tells me that it is. So I'm going to go ahead and, and keep talking here. Um, I've titled the, the webinar How to Run a Code Club, but i um, getting a little bit cheeky, I guess, uh, tongue in cheek, with uh, how you can inspire the next tech billionaire. I've seen worse retirement schemes. And I say that joking, of course, but um, I've worked now personally with you know, uh, over 1,000 young uh, you know, boys and girls, uh, mostly in the age range of eight to 14 or 15 years old. And as they start, uh, I can't help but see parallels to a young Bill Gates or a young Mark Zuckerberg who you know, got access to computer programming skills early in their life and became so comfortable with it that when the problem arose that they wanted to solve, whether that's an operating system for personal computers or a social network that ties everyone together, they knew how to do it. They were able to. Um, you know, use their skills, their technology skills, to build that solution and just push it out to the world. Uh, so pretty interesting. And and of course, you know, being a billionaire isn't the most important thing in the world. But more important than that is is the impact that you can have. And what I tell these kids is, uh, if one of you does end up being a billionaire, you can uh, throw me a bone someday. So that's yeah, that's the retirement scheme. I, <laughs> I say it joking, and the kids think I'm funny, but you know. I am kind of serious. <laughs> um, OK, well, I just wanted to tell my story. Um, and this is, you know, it's it's a little hard to communicate with one chart. But um, basically, I started, I mentioned I'm not a library person. I walked into the, the local library where I live here in Mesa, Arizona in 2013. And I said, uh, you have this computer lab. I've never seen anyone in it. Can I use the computer lab 
to teach kids computer programming. The library staff was very, very su supportive and cooperative of that and, and giving me a go. Um, you know, they had been researching some of these things and hearing about some of the buzz that was already existing at that time. It's, it's much stronger even now. Um, and so what happened was I put up posters around my neighborhood and just uh, the, the library is in a, you know, an urban center. It's, it's a part of town where you don't see um, a lot of the, the types of opportunities for kids that, um, that you would want. And so I just walked around literally sticking with scotch tape posters to lamp posts and things like that. I dropped off a stack at the local elementary school. I dropped off some at the Boys and Girls Club uh, that's just around the corner. And kids started coming. So that was kind of my, my big question is, will they even show up? We had a 15 seat computer lab that from basically the first week was, was filled up with kids um, interested in learning. And so they were patient enough with me as I, as I went to be able to, um, to check uh, or, or, to, or to let me test on them. <laughs> so they've been uh, my guinea pigs all along. Uh, you can see that over the period from August 2013 when we started to about you know the spring of 2014, we were limited by that room. So we had 15 computers, and that was where we decided you know we want to get this to more people. We we had a very long waiting list at that time, and and the goal was to expand. So um, I went online and and put up an Indiegogo campaign, and that was where we said, look, you know we've got these kids learning to code. Um, help us out, contribute. And we had people pitching in anywhere from five to five thousand um, dollars, you know, to support our cause of, of bringing coding to more kids at the library. Um, it's, a, it's a popular sentiment. I think a lot of people feel emotionally connected to the library. And then when you see something like this, which is very 21st century and, and it's an opportunity, they were uh, willing to open their wallets and really help out. So we were able to buy Chromebook computers, and I'll talk a little bit more about te technology choices and things like that. But we bought a cart full of Chromebooks. We were able to bump up our number to 50 kids. And, and in fact, over time, some kids started bringing their own computers and we had local businesses donating computers. And so uh, the, the most we've ever had in a week is I think 57 people coming to, to Code Club. Uh, you know, of, of course it fluctuates, but we've had, um, we've had a lot of success at the, the, the program that I've been running. And basically every week, since August 2013, uh, you know, with accepting holidays and things like that, we've been down there uh, running Code Club. So it's a very steady drumbeat. It's a continuous thing. Um, and so then you see kind of starting at the end of 2014, I started to get phone calls from other libraries, uh, mostly around Arizona. The, the community's uh, very connected here. There's a lot of sharing and information, as, as I believe all librarians uh, are just so generous and willing to kind of share what they're doing. Uh, so we quickly heard from other libraries that wanted to do something similar, and uh, the, the question was, how can we help? And that's where I started spending a lot of my time on the phone and uh, and eventually building kind of some free resources out that I just give away to libraries that want to do something similar to what we're doing. So all of that um, we still do today, and, and I can uh, point you to those resources. By the end, I'd, I'd love to uh, share them with anybody I, I can. Uh, over time, we realized that some people need even more than the free resources. And so we built out a software and a training program and a support network that allows uh, more libraries to be able to do it. And we'll talk about that as well. Uh, we do charge for that. And in fact, um, the, the, the point I'm at in the story right now is this Friday, three days from now, is the last day of my full-time day job working for a California technology company. And starting next Monday, I will be full-time uh, promoting coding for kids all over the country. So uh, it's kind of an exciting time for me, a little bit scary if you ask my wife, but it's, uh, it's, it's fun. And um, I'm really looking forward to accomplishing this mission of, of just bringing access to computer programming to more people. So it was kind of maybe a, a longer version of the story than I ought to have shared, but hopefully that gives you some background with where I'm coming from. You may have seen uh, resources from code.org before. This is a great nonprofit dedicated to raising awareness about computer programming. One of their estimates is that there are a million plus computer jobs that are available now that will increasingly be available in the future and simply not enough people coming through the traditional pipeline. You see the 400,000 
computer science students at, in college uh, to meet those jobs. And so what we're saying is, look, let's, you know, computer programming, like so many things, is, is actually best taught through experience, through uh, doing and, and learning and, and kind of going at your own pace, the way that so many things at, at libraries are learned anyway. Um, and so what we're saying is, look, let's help fill the gap by providing these uh, code clubs at libraries. So hopefully that's a picture, it's a statistic. There's, there's more at code.org and I would encourage you to go there. And I will, by the way, uh, be sharing these slides with everyone, so I'll send these out uh, so, so you'll have them. Um, specifically this video, and I show this video, some of you have probably seen this before. It's a, a five minute video that really just summarizes what programming is and why it's important to people who haven't uh, had a chance to encounter it before. I'm not gonna try to show the video right now over the webinar, but uh, I would encourage you if you have not seen it to look up code.org video and you'll be able to find this. Uh, the, the title on YouTube is what most schools don't teach. Um, I show this to all of the kids and their parents that come to learn computer programming and, and the parents notice things like, oh wow, there's great jobs and kids you know, or young people can learn technology skills and make 80 or 90 or $100,000 a year you know, a really healthy living. Um, meanwhile, the kids watch the video and they notice the rock bands and the video games and all the free food that's being given out at, at the technology companies and, and they're excited about it as well. So um, anyway, just, just a quick plug for that. And, and these resources, among so many other resources, most of what I've done is just found the right resources and pulled them together in a way that I think makes sense. Um, one plug about, libraries so this is important when i started doing coding for kids many of my friends came to me and said okay great so you're going to schools right because that's where kids are and that's where they're already coming to learn um and i said well yeah the kids are there um but there's some things that i really really like about libraries and uh and i've had much better success at libraries to the point where i've actually shifted all of my focus <laughs> on libraries at this point and I'm not trying to work within the framework of the, you know, public education. I, I do have some pilots and tests running with different charter schools and things like that. But some things I really love about the library, it's a trusted community resource. It's looked at differently than the school. It's this treasure of information and, and learning. It's open to everyone, um, as, you know, many things are, but um, the library more so, right? This is a place where it doesn't matter what you look like. Come grab a book off the shelf, teach yourself something. There's these great stories of, of libraries empowering people. Uh, as long as you, you have the curiosity to ask the questions and the motivation to find the answers, uh, you can master things. You know, you, and that's been happening for literally centuries at libraries. Um, and then I would add 21st century learning. And this is where um, I've had the biggest trouble at schools and success at libraries. Um, my model and the, the model that I'm gonna promote today and, and suggest to you is not um, a, like a lecture driven model. It's not about an expert standing there and imparting information to students. It's about a learner, you know, going out and seeking the, the knowledge that they need. And so everybody's doing something different. Everybody's on a different kind of track and pace. Uh, but, but that change, it sounds subtle uh, discussing it like this. I'll get into it some more, but that's actually really important. And that's why I've loved working at the libraries where that's always been the case. If I want to understand, uh, my son right now is doing a paper in school about a guy I had never heard of called Yakima Canuck. He's like a famous stuntman that worked with um, John Wayne in Western movies and he invented a lot of stunts. Well, he went into the library and found information about Yakima Canuck, you know, and, and that's the kind of thing that uh, Yakima Canuck's never going to be covered in a, you know, traditional lecture. Meanwhile, on the coding side, You've got jobs available, very, you know, career and economic success is definitely there. Uh, but bigger than that is, is world changing capability. And it's interesting as you talk to, I have a lot of friends in the technology space. I of course follow, you know, the, the superstars, the, the big movers and shakers in technology. And the way that uh, they approach their thing is not let's use, I'm gonna use my coding skills to make a buck. It's I'm gonna use my coding skills to do something meaningful in the world and disrupt whole industries and make the world better for people. And they, 
they really believe that, you know, and, and I believe it too. I think it's, it's, it's possible. Uh, bigger than that is computational thinking. So even if you don't end up going into computer programming for a job, and many of the kids that I interact with will not be professional software developers, much like a little league uh, for baseball, you know, m most of the kids that come and play baseball as a eight, nine, 10 year old will not be a professional baseball player. That's not the whole point. Uh, the point is let's come and let's, let's experience things and learn things in the process that allows me to be better at life, right? And you, you learn in baseball, teamwork, and, and some of those things. Uh, in computer programming, by the way, you also learn a lot of social skills with the way we're doing it, and we'll get into that. But you learn computational thinking. You learn, okay, a computer can do this uh, more efficiently than the way it's being done today. And that's gonna trigger you to innovate and ask the right questions. It's gonna help you in business and medicine and law and entertainment and whatever you end up doing for your job and for your life. It's a bridge to STEM, it's, it's a connection, it's a very natural connection to science and math and, and engineering and these other, these other topics. And it's just really fun. Uh, and, and I hope I'll be able to communicate that today. Um, okay, just real quick to kind of underscore this, you, you being library uh, people, and, and I imagine you believe in this, you know, the, the mission and, and what's going on with, with libraries. Uh, I really like the story of Andrew Carnegie. Uh, came to America as a young immigrant. His family was destitute, and he lived in Pennsylvania. Um, he had to drop out of school at a very young age. I, I want to say 12. He wasn't able to learn in a formal setting uh, because he had to go to work and, and help support his family. And so that's what he did. He he was working all day, but there was a a local uh, philanthropist or just a wealthy man in the neighborhood that had a private library of books. And he said, uh, any of the you know young people that wanna come and on Saturdays and learn, he just opened his doors and he invited them to come in. And so Andrew Carnegie was one of those people that basically got his training, got his, his education self-guided at the library. Well, what happened as he became the richest man in the world, uh, selling his, biz you know, his giant business and being very successful, he went back and said, I believe in giving people that opportunity, you know, the access through education to be able to do something amazing. And so he, as you, you probably know, uh, personally funded thousands of library buildings and put them all over uh, in a model that was self-sustaining and, and in a way that um, lots, lots of people can get to the library and learn. Well, we're doing the same thing here with coding and, and you know, the, the poetic justice of doing this at the library, we, we believe the same thing, right? Like, let's give people access to the skills that will really open doors for them in life. And coming to the library and learning to code as part of a, a library program for youth is, I mean, it's really the 21st century equivalent to what happened in Andrew Carnegie's life. So I just want to kind of throw that out there as a story and get you thinking along those lines. I, like I said at the beginning, I believe that you're already inspired by this cause and you're excited about it. So I'm not going to spend any more time uh, trying to get you pumped up about coding besides just underscoring that the fact that you're here today uh, is, is evidence that you are, uh, you know, that, that you're ready and you're in a position to make big impact in people's lives. And I just want to uh, reaffirm that you really will be able to do that. So what is Code Club? I mean, let's talk about some nuts and bolts a little bit. I've been kind of referring to it, but not talking about it. So I want to say uh, what we're doing with Code Club, and this is a model we've sort of revisited and refined over uh, you know, the two and a half years that I've been at it. Um, but it, it pulls from my experience teaching myself computer programming languages and a lot of friends who have also taught themselves. Basically, um, we take the best elements of a traditional classroom we combine them with the best elements of an online learning system. So it's, it truly is hybrid in that sense. And so what you're talking about here is a regular meeting, you know, just like you can imagine signing up for the computer programming class in college, you would show up certain days, uh, but instead of lecturing at those meetings, you sit in person with other kids that are also learning and you're, learn you're doing your online uh, tasks and tutorials and building projects and experiencing things so it's it's heavily you know interactive there's there's much there's a lot of peer interaction um it's self-guided so everyone's doing something different and it's very informal so if somebody's 
particularly interested in the visual aspects of computer programming, and they want to make you know just the coolest looking images and animations that they want, they can go down that road and spend you know week after week. And I, I'm saying this from experience because Kyler, one of my friends, just has a gift. I mean, he's one of my friends. He's 11 years old, but he comes to my code club and he has a gift for uh, creating really cool looking you know uh, animations and, and images. And so that's his. He's a, he's a visual person. He's customized his experience to be visual. And sitting next to him is Aaron, who is more uh, logical and, and rational and wants to kind of figure out the nuts and bolts of, of writing the code. So there's lots of different ways to go within this. And, and my goal with kind of setting up this code club model is to make it uh, open and, and positive for all those people. And I believe that you actually find uh, benefits by having those people sitting next to each other. So an ex example I was just using, Kyler's able to create the characters, Aaron and others are able to you know, animate them or, or build them into a computer game. And you have now this high quality production formed by a team of 10 and 11 year olds that, you know, it's, it's really pretty amazing to watch what they're able to do. And this is all self-formulated. I don't need to structure it. I don't need to uh, create it. I, I just provide the, you know, the encouragement to kind of get them along the, the learning process, the self-learning process. And so I'll just say, I guess the important words here are facilitated self-learning. Uh, the kids are learning on their own, uh, but they wouldn't at home. They, they would get stuck or they'd get discouraged or they'd get distracted. The fact that they're coming together socially and that you're there as the facilitator is really what's helping them to be consistent with this and make progress over time. So just as a kind of a, <laughs> to, to make it very, very clear, when I'm training um, librarians to deliver code clubs at their library, I uh, immediately put this up and I say, look, never ever will you stand in front of the class and lecture. You don't have to do that. Uh, it's it's self-guided from the start. And so the picture on the right where of informal learning is really the way that this is going to happen. The, the, the kid comes in, they don't know anything. So we guide them to a video about what is coding, that same one I was referring to earlier. Here's what coding is. Here's why it's important. And then we give them some puzzles that you know help them um, you know, try their hand and and get some quick wins and experience it. And then down the road, you know, they're they're trying to build their own project. And as they're kind of taking those steps, if they're stuck on things, they can go ask a neighbor or they can uh, work through it with trial and error. That's the little guy with the shovel. Uh, they can go search Google or or walk out the door of the program room where where we're sitting and find a book about JavaScript. You know, and literally look at a book and learn computer programming. So there's a lot of different ways they can go. Uh, and it's it's very much an informal learning experience. Hopefully that's making sense. This is the, the point in the webinar where I'd really love to be able to see everyone and, and ask you if this is making sense. I'm going to go ahead and um, close out of this right now. Let me stop sharing my screen. I'm going to check really quick questions. Okay, can everybody, um, sorry, I was over on the, on the screen sharing. Can you see my slides at this point? Because I, I just saw that uh, people weren't able to see the, the slides. And I'm flipping through them like everybody can get them. Oh, no, tell me you can see that. Okay, I'm waiting for someone to chat at me and tell me that they can see the slides not anymore it was stuck on the slides but were you able to see the ones that i that i just went through or it was on the first slide the whole time okay well that is unfortunate um oh you guys i'm really sorry about that because they were, they were really good slides um I'm going to try this now. I'm going to go back and share my screen again. And this time, I'm going to use this. Share. OK. Um, so hopefully, this is working. We're going to try to show this video. And what this video is going to do is give you a glimpse into our code club. It's only a minute long, so we'll just watch it. Um, it's, sometimes it's nice to just see and feel what a code club looks like.
And hopefully this will work. Okay, so that was, oops, difficult to hear the audio. Okay, darn it. Well, you guys, I'm really sorry. This is my, uh, like I said earlier, this is my first time using this technology and it will probably be my last. It's not working well. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the, um, to the PowerPoint now and tell me if you can see that. Does that show up? There's a way to just talk to you guys. Okay, I didn't see anybody chat chat back, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, continue with this. Hopefully the slides are working now because this is where we get into some of the nuts and bolts. And like I said earlier, I'm, um, I am sending these slides out to everyone. I apologize that they didn't advance as I was uh, talking through. They advanced for me, but somehow not for you. Um, okay, so we're at this point now where hopefully you're excited about computer programming. You think, yeah, let's let's do coding in my um, in my library, but I don't know computer programming. And this is what I hear in nine times out of ten. You know, uh, that this is the objection. This is why uh, I'm not going to be able to do it. And I get these eye rolls like Doctor Who, you know, like um, I just, <laughs> I can't do computer programming. Um, okay, well, this is the most important part of the whole webinar and hopefully the slides are working now so you can see it. Um, this is my, my important point. Anyone can run a code club. There's no tech skill required. And I'll back that up with a, with a story while I go check and check the chat and make sure you guys can see the slides. But, um, Okay, they're working. Good, good, good. Um, the story goes, uh, when, I, when I first started, you know, I have a technology background, but I've also spent a lot of time with kids. Uh, so I'm, I, I sort of come from both worlds. The, uh, you know, the, the working with children, even though I'm not a formal educator, uh, I've done a lot between personal life and, and uh, church and scouts and things that I've done uh, where I've worked with young people. Um, my immediate thought was, Okay, I need to find uh, programmers and put them in all these libraries. So that, that was my strategy. And I actually went online and, and in fact, a lot of them found me through some of the press coverage that came through with what we're doing. This is really funny, just keep watching John Stewart over and over again, blowing his mind. Um, but um, some of the press coverage that, uh, that we got, so uh, local computer programmers, were emailing me out of the blue and it was awesome. They said, look, I love what you're doing. I believe in this. Programming has made all the difference for me in my career. I wanna give back, how can I help? And some of those people uh, were consistent enough that I said, look, I'm gonna put you in charge of a code club. So I set up other libraries with a, a code club and, and, and the way I did that was basically, I just put this person, this volunteer, tech volunteer in the room every week for two hours and kind of taught them all of this stuff and said, look, okay, here's how it works. Here's what you're supposed to do. Um, and those code clubs, even though the, the expert was in the room, 
did not succeed. And I was really scratching my head over this. Like, how could this be that, um, you know, I've got the expert there. These are people who are excited about it. They were willing to go. And what it turned out when I would go observe these, these code clubs was there was this lack of comfort with children and uh, just interpersonal enthusiasm. It just wasn't coming. Even though these were excited people, they weren't able to make that connection with the kids. That truly is an art form, you know, to be able to inspire and, and connect. Meanwhile, I had another code club that I had helped set up in a different part of town. Um, and this one, we were so frustrated because we couldn't find any technology experts to uh, come in and, and help with this code club. And so the librarians there who didn't know anything about computer programming, they're like, well, we don't, we don't want to um, just sit around and wait. Let's go ahead and start. While we keep looking for, for a tech expert to come help us, we'll just try it. You know? and, and we went through the same kind of training and said, OK, here's how it works. Here's what we're doing. Um, and what happened was awesome because the code club with these two women that um, did not consider themselves computer programming experts at all. In fact, one of them said it was a self-proclaimed, you know, grandma that was a technology Luddite. She's like, I'm a grandma, I'm a Luddite, I don't know anything. Uh, but she just loved kids, loves kids, and works with them uh, successfully on a regular basis. And so what was happening was these kids were coming in and uh, just so excited to show uh, Marie, in this case, all of the cool stuff that they worked on at home and, and what they're able to do. And she was genuinely amazed. And that connection was so powerful, was way more important, in fact, than uh, the, the tech, you know, startup software guy that was sitting with, with a different code club and not resonating, not connecting. So hopefully that, um, you know, that story illustrates it. But we'll talk a little bit about kind of the specifics, uh, just, just to kind of put some data behind it. I, I just took a piece of our map. Um, this isn't all of the code clubs, but these are ones where I'm working directly uh, with the team. And you see, these are not all in the middle of Phoenix, where you have uh, technology companies uh, all over the place, and it's easy to find. All of these code clubs are running with librarians in charge, or librarians are running it. And some of these are small libraries in rural areas where uh, you know it's, it's just one or two people that are doing all the programming and all the collections. You know, I mean, they're, they're not um, huge, well-staffed libraries. I, we, of course, have those as well, and, and, and you're able to do different things. But I just want to make it clear that it's, it's possible to do this everywhere. I put a quote on here from Sean um, at Southeast Regional Library. And Sean's been an inspiration to me because, you know, uh, like many people, I walked in there and started talking to him about coding. And he said, well, I don't, I don't know how to code. But he was game. You know, he was willing to try. Uh, and what, what Sean was able to do was just give it a go. He said, I found out there was nothing to be nervous about. Print provided everything to get up and running. And, and it was awesome to watch him evolve and, and now uh, really push the program with leadership of his own. So he's innovating and, and adding things. And I'm taking ideas from him. And it's been uh, really cool to watch uh, as, as people like Sean are able to kind of take that first step. And that's maybe the risk to say, oh, well, I don't know coding, but I'll give it a try. And that's really what it is. And you show up and, uh, and you go from there. And it, and it really does work. I'll just talk a little bit about uh, some, some tactics and some, some devices we've used. Uh, this, uh, this idea of the method of the grandmother is uh, you know, something I really like. And, and it comes from a, a man named Sugata Mitra. Who's, that's who's pictured there. But Sugata Mitra is a researcher. And he did a project in India, rural India, where he uh, found some kids that didn't have school, they didn't speak English, uh, no formal education, uh, very, very poor uh, part of the world. And what he did was put a computer in their village. He, uh, you know, the original one was he just took a wall and cut a hole in the wall and put this computer with a little mouse and keyboard. And the uh, kids would show up and, um, and just play with it, you know, interact with it. They were amazed by the technology and, um, and working with it. Well, over time, as those kids continued to, uh, to look at things, he decided to start giving them challenges where he would say, OK, now I want you to, to learn about DNA replication, which is a you know, pretty sophisticated topic from biology that you would get in a you know, private school or something like that. Well, these kids didn't have a teacher, didn't have a school. But standing outside, interacting with that computer, they were able to find the information and teach themselves something about DNA replication, and they got 30% like 
correct on the test, which is amazing, right? I mean, given that there's nothing else besides just a bunch of kids with one computer. Well, the next thing he said was, well, what if we just get a, um, a woman from the village that, that knew the kids? So she was a friend with the kids, but she didn't know anything about technology or DNA replication. And he said, just, you know, come, come help them. You're not a teacher. He said, use, use the method of the grandmother. And this is where it really applies here. He says, just stand behind them and admire them all the time. Say, that's cool. That's fantastic. What is that? Can you do that again? So he's asking all these, um, you know, just great encouraging questions. And I immediately saw in this TED talk exactly what I had already seen with Marie and, and the code club that she had been working with uh, in, in Arizona. And so it's not about the technology skill. It's about encouraging and, and being interested. And then, and, and we'll get to this, guiding a process of finding the answers on your, your own. Uh, so the golden question that I always tell people to use is walk around the room, not in front of the room, uh, behind, you know, so you're walking up to kids that are working on their computer and you just say, what are you working on? Now, it sounds so dead simple, but that's enough to trigger them. The fact that you're interested in it reinforces it and they'll show you what they've been making and what they've been doing and, and they're more encouraged to uh, try harder on the, the next thing. So um, anyway, hopefully that makes sense. This idea of the method of the grandmother, uh, it's just really powerful and it, it's funny, my partner is a PhD in computer programming. I have these degrees and all this experience writing code. In, in our cases, we almost have to force ourselves or remind ourselves that it's not about what we know, it's about our connection and our encouragement. So we will often bite our tongue and not try to answer their technology questions for them but instead be interested in them and guide them to a process that will help them to find the answers themselves. And that, you know, I'm, I'm saying that as somebody who could stand up there and deliver a lecture, it's better to not do that. <laughs> and that's where, uh, once we, we had that realization, that's where I got really excited because I, I realized this can go in every library in the country. And, and so that's our stated goal right now. Okay. But, uh, great, but I don't have time to do this. And we're encouraging you do it weekly. Um, that's that's could feel like a big stretch. You might feel like Elmo and uh, want to fall on your head. So I want to talk a little bit about that um, because on the one hand, you're right. Um, there is kind of an administrative burden, even if you don't have to. And I and I would encourage you not to try to become a computer programming expert or, or go get a computer science degree before you do this. But um, but even if you know, okay, I don't have to be an expert, I still have to put together, you know, all of the like the resources, like what websites are they going to go to, what types of, of activities are they going to do, uh, those kinds of questions, and then track them um, over time. That can take time, and it, it can be a little bit uh, tedious just from an administrative perspective. I don't, uh, again, let me reiterate, I don't want you to not do that because you're worried about your tech skills. That's not the reason to not do this, but but um, on the one hand, it can be tedious to put together a program. Um, if you have the staff time, so on the left of the slide, if you have the staff time, I've created a Code Club resource kit. So it outlines, um, you know, a lot of this, uh, the philosophy of, you know, be interested in the kids, guide them to find their own answers. We have a specific process where we won't answer their questions when the kids raise their hand. And it's so funny to see their their face, you know, coming from school where, you know, they just sit politely and raise their hand when they don't know something and the teacher tells them the answer. Well, it's like, well, that's not the way it works in real life and that's not the way it works in Code Club. Uh, so when a kid raises their hand, I will immediately ask them, okay, well, what have you tried so far? And, and get them talking about, you know, their own effort. You're, you're encouraging them to do everything that they can try to, um, to find an answer. And then if they haven't, uh, you know, once they've done that, and they still haven't found an answer, I will encourage them to get out, get out of a chair, go find a peer. So all of that is, is described and I'm not gonna go, have time to go into it. It's you know a 20 page document that has everything from how to promote the code club and resources for that. And there's like a poster template in there. There's a description of, of what you need to get started and, and things like that. And then some of these resources that we do use as we're guiding kids through. So you know I mentioned code.org, there's another eight or 10 resources out there. And so we've listed a bunch of them uh, in this resource kit. 
and want to give that away. So that's a free download. I'll give you the link at the end of where to go for that, and it'll be in these slides. But I would encourage everybody to, to do that uh, today. You know, just download that resource kit. There's there's no risk there. Um, if you don't have time, so even with the resource kit, that you still have to kind of build a program and, and do it. Uh, and so that's where we found a lot of people still didn't have the time to do that, even though we had convinced them, okay, you don't need the tech skills. And at that point, it's like, okay, what do I do? Well, we created software that, that does that all for you. So instead of, of putting together a program, you just have the kids come in and, and log into the software. So they, they show up at, in our case, 3.30 on Mondays, and they log themselves in, and the software asks them, okay, well, what do you want to work on today? And here's you know, the level that you're on right now, and here's what you've done so far, and here's some project ideas for if you want to build a project instead of signing off levels and that kind of stuff. And I'm not going to go into more detail on that either just because um, that's, anyway, that's that's going to take way too much time. But just to kind of summarize what it is, is, um, you know, the whole goal is to just save you time to have you show up. And that's a, a training session for, you know, whoever's providing that from the library software that I was just describing and, uh, you know, s support. And that's support on how the software works, but much bigger than that. It's it's if you have questions about what to do with a kid that, um, you know, is not engaging with code.org or if they say they've already done some of this and then they, they it proves that they're not as good as they think. You know, we can kind of help you through those kinds of things. And even as far as I can't figure out how to do this one thing in Scratch or in JavaScript or HTML. Like, we'll, we'll help with whatever we can, just sort of being the safety net there. So that's the piece that um, that we sell. And I, I didn't mean for this to be a sales pitch. wanted to throw it out there as what we're doing. Uh, but more than anything, I want to convince you that you, you should go for it. You should you should make this, um, make this a priority and get a code club going at your library and I'm happy to be, you know, helpful in any way I can. So let's, um, I guess just talking through the checklist, here's some things that, that you're gonna want to have allocated and determined as you think about starting a code club. Uh, and hopefully by now uh, you are thinking about starting a code club. Um, so, okay, you need a space. Uh, this is, code club is loud and it's, it's interactive and there's people out of their chair. So I highly recommend somewhere, you know, often a program room or a computer lab, somewhere where there's not, um, you know, you're not on the public computers and you're encouraging it. You know, that, that can be a little tricky if you're trying to do quiet. Although I have had people um, shut down the library. So some of these smaller libraries will, you know, they, they, the library closes at five. They'll start their code club at five. And so then they've got the whole building to themselves and the kids can be as crazy as they want uh, using public computers. So that can be a, a solution uh, if you're short on computers or short on space. Um, facilitators, so that's you and, and your team, hopefully, uh, but you need you know at least one person that's really gonna champion champion this and kind of be the, the owner of this project. And I would recommend backup, you know, maybe two or three uh, extras. People that are gonna be comfortable around the kids is the main thing that, you know, they're, they're game to learn things and to try and figure things out. Just to reiterate, they don't have to be coding experts. Now, I'm not discouraging you. If you have volunteers that come to your library and you know they want to help out, use those people. I mean, please do. Please bring them in as much as they'll be willing to do. What I found is that uh, relying on them to run the program doesn't work because they don't get the program. And uh, it's hard for them to be consistent over time. So I, I want to see something that, that really will stay but having kids interact directly with somebody that makes a living at, at software is just a great great thing and i've done that as you know one-offs where i'll bring people in and say hey look this is my friend joe you know he works for this software company and he's you know he sits at home most days and his cat's like climbing on his shoulders and the kids just think it's really interesting to kind of see uh, what those jobs look like you also need computers uh, you can't ask for kids to bring them from home uh, but you will probably find, and depending on where you are, you'll find kids that need a computer, that need to borrow a computer, uh, really open on this because everything we're doing is is internet-based. Um, you know, so so really any type of computer. I get the question a lot about um, tablets, and some of these tools use Flash as a technology to, to teach computer programming. You, though, Flash does not work on iPads. 
So if you have a, like a cart of iPads, there are things you can do and please email me and I'll, I'll uh, give you some ideas. There's some apps you can download and things. They tend to be best for younger kids and as the kids uh, progress, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, by that point, uh, typically they do need a computer with a keyboard to be able to, um, you know, to keep taking those steps. You really can't do HTML on a tablet, for example. Um, and then you want a day and time. So I recommend that, that consistent weekly meeting. I do work with libraries that go every other week, uh, things like that. What you'll have there is just somebody gets confused and shows up on the wrong week. Um, but yeah, one and a half hours is, is what I do. I, it's, it's pretty ideal. Uh, you can expand that to two. Um, that last half hour, we used to do two hour sessions and that last half hour we would use for a showcase, a show and tell, just for the kids, um, you know, but each kid gets a chance to get up. Whoever wants to that day can get up and present on the projector what they were able to, uh, what they were able to build. Okay, I'm gonna get to pro tips in just a second, but I'm going to quickly click over to the chat and just make sure that nobody has asked any question. Okay, um, I do want questions though, so please do, uh, I'm gonna go through some pro tips here for you guys. And um, as I do that, write your questions because I'll have a few minutes at the end. Um, and then I do have my contact info and I'm gonna send you these slides. So I wanna make sure that uh, you've got something useful coming out of this and I just still feel terrible about that. Problem with the first slide being shown for the whole webinar. Man, that's embarrassing. Okay, so we're gonna do some pro tips. Um, talk about computers. You know, I, I've seen all sorts of things from, um, you know, MacBook Pros that somebody got from a grant uh, all the way down. We have used donated, you know, computers. We've used PCs, we've used Mac. Um, when I did my fundraiser and we had $10,000 to buy computers, my goal was to get this to as many kids as possible. And so I went online and found uh, Chromebooks. And those, I mean, you can see $180, $170 at Walmart. Um, it's just really tough to beat for a computer. And um, at, that allows you to, of course, open the door to so many people. But we've been using them now for over two years since we raised the money and bought those computers. And they're uh, doing fine. Like, we haven't had any issues uh, you know, they're, they're a workhorse. We've even lent them to, you know, use them for other programs, so taking them out for coding competitions or um, other library programs that are doing things uh, that need computers. And, uh, you know, I've had really good luck. Plus, they have um, supervised user features, so you can kind of limit what, uh, what the kids are able to do online, and, and that, um, you know, of course, provides safety, but it, it can also provide focus and, and just help keep the kids uh, on track. So that's pro tip number one, use inexpensive computers. I, I don't wanna tell you you need $2,000 per kid to buy them the top of the line MacBook. Pro tip, track metrics. Okay, so, and, and of course you know this, metrics are really, really important for programming. Um, they're also important from collections on the, the other side of the library, right? So digital subscriptions and things like that. Uh, and so what you wanna do is, is be sure that you have this. So if you're running the program yourself, um, you know, keep a spreadsheet, count the kids every week. I mean, you know the drill, this isn't uh, rocket science, but some of the other things you can track, and I'm giving you an example here, this is an automated email that comes out of the software that, that we have, where it'll tell you, um, you know, your attendance for that week, and the past four weeks, um, the new users registered. So you want to see, you know, growth, and you want to see how how things are changing over time. Um, tasks completed. So that's, you know, that shows you kids progressing. And it looks like in this week nobody progressed. Projects submitted. Um, and there's a way for, you know, for you to be able to. What you're going to want to do is capture those projects so that you can, you know, share them with with others and. Um, make it more engaging in that sense. And then the last thing um, from the software perspective, which is nice to be able to track, is logins outside Code Club. So this is, you know, if somebody came to, to Code Club for those two hours, but then they went home and kept working on stuff, I wanna know that because what that allows me to do is kind of make the case internally 
for uh, you know continuing this and showing the impact that we're having, not just as a program, but really as a resource, a digital resource for for our members. And so total total members is a number you can show active users recently. Um, these are I'm showing this because these are a bunch of ideas for the types of things that you may want to um, track. And there's there's probably other ones as you go, but tracking metrics. Um, you know, I, I've been hanging in and around libraries for two and a half years, and I, I haven't yet to see the end of the appetite for metrics from the, you know, library management side of the world. Um, okay, pro tip, show and tell. So um, this is just, you know, it's a simple kindergarten concept, but it's, it's magical, it really is, and it provides just a really strong motivating factor for uh, kids to want to, to work hard, learn things, and make something cool. Uh, so what we'll do is occasionally, um, you know, we'll have the people who have, have submitted a project or if they've met, you know, you could do like a challenge of the week. So today's challenge, we're going to everybody try to make a bingo game or something. And whoever makes that gets to sit in the front and plug in their computer and, and show it to the rest of the group. We've, we've even taken this a step further and um, created uh, showcase nights where we'll invite the parents in to, um, you know, parents and even city council and the mayor and things like that to come see the, you know, the, the projects that the kids have made. And those end up being a really cool, rewarding experience. Everybody walks away more excited and, and you'll end up boosting program attendance by doing that because, you know, somebody learns about it that didn't know about it before. So important pro tip. Uh, so in a similar vein, press coverage, uh, this is just a story that, that people really that the, the public wants to hear, right? This is positive press. This is kids learning and, and preparing for the future. So it's very relevant. Um, if you have, for example, a local um, you know, PR person within your city government or your county government, just tell them what you're doing. And uh, oftentimes, they'll be able to pitch a story and get something on TV or, or in the newspaper. And that just ends up, it's fun for the kids. It's great for your program because um, you know, it's just adding visibility and the general public then sees this and you're going to drive attendance and drive more uh, participation. So that probably goes without saying, but just do that, get, get the press coverage. And that's uh, everything I prepared. So like I said, I'm going to send these slides to everybody that registered for this webinar. Um, I've added here my personal email address. Uh, please email me with anything. Um, two websites to look at. The first one, library.prenda.co is where, um, is where you can go for um, for that resource kit. So that free resource kit that I was talking about, that's where you'll download that. Uh, and then the other one, codeclub.prenda.co is, is really geared towards parents more and it's more just explanatory of what a code club is, but you can get some uh, useful information and if you're trying to explain to somebody else at your library, uh, you know, what was this webinar all about, that can be a place to go. And then I put my phone number uh, I welcome any contact. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm happy to chat with you about it and try to help you get your code club up and running. Um, let me, at this point, close out of that, turn off my screen share. Okay, I'm back on. And flip back over to the questions to make sure. Okay, I don't see any new questions. So um, at this point, you know, we're, we're getting close to the end. If you have a question, type it in right now because I'll, uh, I'll look at it. But um, I think the questions actually will stay on later. And so uh, feel free to, you know, put your questions in there and I'll, I'll try to be responsive there as well. Plus uh, the, you know, the email and the phone number that I will be sending you here in a minute. Um, Apologies again. I'm I'm really sorry for the the glitch there on the, the PowerPoint, um, but hopefully we've been able to provide something helpful for you and, and make it worth your time to come. Um, thanks again for joining today, and and just a big thank you for your interest in uh, helping kids to learn programming. This really, um, I mentioned at the beginning, I'm quitting my day job, which is a, a perfectly good day job that I actually like, but compared to the experience of helping young people kind of get a taste of computer programming, to see that like aha moment in their eyes and have them realize what they're capable of 
uh, it, it truly is transformational for me and I hope it is for you too. I hope, hope you get that experience and, and get the kids and teens at your library going with this. Um, and again, just reach out to me if I can help you in any way. Uh, thanks so much for joining today and putting up with me and my technology issues as well. I know that's ironic. I recognize that. Um, anyway, I will uh, stop talking now. I don't see any more comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, you're welcome. Thank you guys so much. Okay, the flyer I took to the schools is a question that's in there. And yes, that's in the uh, resource kit that I uh, that I have for download. So if you you can download it there, or you can just email me and uh, remind me to send it to you. Cool. Um, okay. Well, thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate your time and good luck with all of your efforts at uh, at getting coding going at your library. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the broadcast now. Thank you so much, and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.